And now our featured speakers tonight, which is Dan Bell and Chris Collins, who will tell us about what's going on at Steigerwald Lake National Wildlife Refuge. And to give us enough time to get through everything we have planned for you tonight, please hold your questions for Dan and Chris until the end. We'll have a few minutes for Q&A directly after their presentations. So no worries. And um, go for it, Dan. We're ready when you are. Thanks, Natasha. Um... Okay, and thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, I also want to just extend a heartfelt appreciation to all of our volunteers and activists. Um, tough year to do that kind of work, but we uh, all look forward to seeing you and working more closely with you in the future. And I want to thank Chris Collins for joining me. Uh, he's really got the great slide deck here. So I'm going to go through and uh, talk a little bit about Steigerwald and some history and some interesting background. Uh, and then he's going to show you um, a look at the future uh, out there. So um, my goal today is to just talk about this really amazing place uh, and the amazing story behind it that not many of us know. I certainly didn't know it before I started working with this organization and listening to Kevin Gorman and others uh, talk about the history of this place. Uh, of course, we know Steigerwald is Washington's gateway to the gorge, but there's so much more to the story uh, that got us to this place. And we have to start uh, with recognizing that this area, largely between Washougal and White Salmon, both sides of the Columbia River, was the traditional territory of the Cascade people. And one of the distinctive things with these lower uh, Columbia groups was their access and use of wapato. Of course, their diet was largely based on fish, but wapato uh, served a very similar uh, uh, starchy substance as maybe camas and uh, was a really distinctive food source for that group of people. They were, uh, as Natasha mentioned, of course, largely um, heavily impacted by smallpox and malaria uh, during the 1800s. In, uh, you know, so as we move forward, uh, interestingly, in 1792, uh, near Washougal, um, Lieutenant William Broughton claimed the territory for Britain. Lewis and Clark passed through several years later. Uh, but really to get down to Steigerwald, um, it was first homesteaded in the mid 1800s by a guy named Joseph Gibbons, the namesake of Gibbons Creek. Um, interestingly, he followed uh, uh, the Oregon Trail, ferried a bunch of cattle across uh, the river at the Dalles and then brought them down along the Columbia. And then in the early 1900s, the property ended up in the ownership of the Steigerwald family which operated a dairy herd and had a pretty prominent uh, set of dairy stores in Portland. But the real star of tonight's sh uh, show is the Columbia River itself. Uh, just uh, one, as you all know, an amazing uh, feature on the landscape uh, and the power and the, uh, the things that it's done for the Columbia River Gorge uh, leave us all in awe all the time. Uh, so just a couple of pictures to talk about the Steigerwald area and the Columbia River. Uh, this is a picture in uh, around 1930. Uh, no surprise, at higher water levels, the area around Steigerwald would typically be underwater. And to think just a little bit about the function of the floodplain here at Steigerwald, uh, this is a, a higher water event in 1939. And as the water in the Columbia River rises, it essentially backs in and fills. You can see there's a lot of standing water in the Steigerwald area. Um, but the features, uh, the sandbars, the, um, the forests, things are really in good shape. Uh, the Gibbons Creek is in good shape and the alluvial floodplain. 1956, this is just a lower, uh, lower water level, but you can still see, maybe there isn't a lot, as much standing water, but you still see channels, you still, still see the riparian forest, the alluvial floodplain, and those key elements of the, the river system. And then of course, at very high water events, this was the year of the Vanport flood uh, the water simply just overtops and flows directly through, but that's uh, characteristically at very high water events. To bring our story uh, up to uh, Steigerwald National Wildlife Refuge, you really want to start uh, in the late 70s as Interstate 205 was being, con uh, the construction began on Interstate 205 outside of Portland. People knew that that would create tremendous development pressures uh, in the smaller communities of Camas, Washougal, and up the Columbia Gorge. Uh, the access to the outer uh, edges of the Portland metro area, we're going to make this a very appealing place to be. 
And in fact, the Steigerwald area was zoned for and envisioned to be heavy industrial use. And among other things, um, a nuclear power plant was proposed there. The access to uh, hydropower made it a very uh, um, valuable industrial uh, uh, opportunity. But fortunately, there was already another alternative future developing. This is a picture, uh, and I, I credit a lot of this to uh, a walking encyclopedia on, on Steigerwald, uh, Wilson Cady, who uh, um, provided this picture and recounted the story of uh, folks from Washington, D.C. coming out to look at Steigerwald to determine if there were or not wetlands there. Uh, and in his uh, writing of it, you can easily tell the people who are from D.C. because they're walking around in three-piece suits as opposed to the folks who were here locally. And then that torch was carried amongst uh, by many people, but uh, including Nancy Russell and John Yon, who were really champions of the protection of the Columbia River Gorge and the National Scenic Area Act. In the mid 80s, uh, really things started to come together for Steigerwald. Uh, Senator Mark Hatfield of Oregon, interestingly, uh, introduced legislation to create the National Wildlife Refuge. And, um, and of course, in 1986, the National Scenic Area was created. In 1984, the Trust for Public Land stepped in and purchased an option uh, on really the first piece of property that would become the core of the National Wildlife Refuge. And then finally, uh, shortly thereafter in 87, uh, the National Wildlife Refuge was officially created. So things took a very different turn and to all of our benefit. And where it leaves us today is with Washington's gateway to the gorge and really uh, a tremendous urban refuge. Uh, it has continued along with the Sandy River Delta to be the place where you noticeably see that transition from uh, the Portland, Vancouver metro area and those surrounding communities into the national scenic area. And it, because of its proximity, it's also an urban refuge for people to get to solace nature uh, that is very accessible to uh, a good number of people. Tremendous conservation values in the Steigerwald area, including the not only just the river, but the floodplains and the floodplain forest. Uh, that provide amazing habitat and important habitat for a lot of the waterfowl um, that are so prominent in Steigerwald, especially over the winter months. And more recently, upland habitats like the Oregon white oak that I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, and others have joined in the effort, including the Washington Department of Natural Resources. Again, Steigerwald serves as an outdoor classroom for students, particularly in the Washougal area. And Friends has used that uh, site over the years many times uh, to engage students in outdoor education and um, learning opportunities. As Chris is gonna tell you, it's also the largest restoration project on the lower Columbia River. Uh, and I will not steal his thunder, I will just move on. And again, just recognize that it's a great place to engage volunteers. This is a picture from early in 2020, seems like forever ago, where we partnered with a local um, group the Gorge Refuge Stewards to host a planting party out at Steigerwald. It was the first of many that were supposed to happen in 2020, and as it turned out, it was the only one. But we do look forward, and I know the Estuary Partnership does as well, to the opportunity to get volunteers back there, back out there on a larger scale. So I'm going to go through a series of slides next, uh, really just trying to tell the story of uh, how Steigerwald was built. It's easy, especially in, uh, at this point in time, to forget that when you're trying to protect a place like Steigerwald, you do it tract by tract, uh, real estate transaction by real estate transaction. And uh, you often can forget all of the hard work that goes into every single one of those. And really, in the case of Steigerwald, what is amazing is that as recently as the um, 1984, all of this land was in private ownership. It was being used. Um, and uh, the momentum was just beginning for protection of that area. In 1986, I'll try to uh, uh, orient you to the colors as you'll see them come in. Blue would be the National uh, Wildlife Refuge of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. In 86, the Fish and Wildlife Service was able to acquire the, that first core block that I mentioned that TPL had uh, secured an option on. Of course, in 1987, the refuge was actually authorized. The National Scenic Area Act had been passed and that uh, line you see showing up here. But then things were quiet until the mid nineties. Uh, 1993, you see the Forest Service, which is shown in green, 
um, pick up a couple of pieces of property. And then you start to see the pace pick up. Yellow you'll see here is what we call conservation buyers. Those can be either land trusts or private individuals who just wanna step in, hold a piece of property uh, in order to allow it to make go through the process to make its way into public ownership. 95, you see the Fish and Wildlife Service continuing to acquire property. 96, another conservation buyer, that was a Nancy Russell purchase. Trust for Public Land in both Col and Columbia Land Trust both played a role in these early days in protecting properties. By 2000, you started to see the um, refuge really amounting to some pretty good size more conservation buyers. And then pink is the uh, Washington Department of Natural Resources, which had authorized and, and started to acquire property for its Washougal Oaks Preserve. Uh, so they started to get in the game and started to do some significant land protection, closed up the gap between the Forest Service ownership. And piece by piece, it all came together. In 2009, uh, the Friends of the Columbia Gorge Land Trust uh, took ownership of that former Nancy Russell property and started to get involved here. Private individuals stepped in to protect uh, that area, which became a future addition to the National Wildlife Refuge. 2017, uh, we were able to protect that Steigerwald uh, Shores property. And then in just the last couple of years, we've been able to see those properties all make their way last year into public ownership. And so Collectively, over a lot of years with a lot of effort, uh, we've actually cobbled together a pretty significant uh, and contiguous chunk of property um, that now comprises not only the National Wildlife Refuge, but other protected lands around it. And as I get ready to turn it over to Chris, I just want to um, um, remind everybody how important that Steigerwald Shores piece of property was for, the, um, for this restoration project that he's going to talk about to go forward. It really was a central component of what needed to happen in order to allow all of the rest of the pieces of this really amazing restoration project to go forward. So I'm gonna wrap up and thank you. Uh, before we turn it over to Chris, I'll stop sharing my screen. We're gonna go ahead and um, play a, a short video from the Lower Columbia Estuary Partnership that just provides uh, some really great background and context for the project before Chris jumps in and, uh, and shows you his really fantastic pictures and slides. So thank you again. You all are amazing and we can't wait to see you. You may have noticed some construction at the Steigerwald Lake Refuge this summer and wondered what it's all about. Hopefully this video will provide some helpful background on the Steigerwald Reconnection Project and what has been happening the last several months. The land where the refuge now sits is part of the ancestral homelands of native tribes such as the Chinook, Klickitat, and Cowlitz. From time immemorial until the 1960s, the wetlands here flooded when the Columbia River was high, creating a safe haven for juvenile salmon, lamprey, and many other native species. The natural flood cycle brought in nutrients that supported a diverse array of wetland and riparian plants, and the site was especially popular with waterfowl and many other native bird species. Since the 1960s, the floodplain has been cut off from the Columbia River's flow by a 5.5 mile levee system constructed by the Army Corps of Engineers. A fish ladder allows access to Gibbons Creek but not the floodplain, which is now cut off from the nutrient cycle brought by the Columbia's annual high water events and larger floods such as the 1948 flood shown here. Without floodwaters and nutrients, invasive species like Himalayan blackberry, teasel, Reed canary grass and thistles took over the refuge, forming vast monocultures across the site. Although the levee system protects the port and other properties from the Columbia River floods, it is difficulty dealing with the flooding from Gibbons Creek, which empties into the refuge floodplain and threatens SR-14 and the port of Camas Washougal's industrial park with flooding. To address these problems, work has begun on building two new setback levees. The new setback levees allow for the removal of over two miles of existing levee while still protecting critical infrastructure near the refuge. When completed, these new levees will also allow Gibbons Creek to drain directly into the floodplain and river, which not only restores passage into the site for lamprey and salmon, but also eliminates the need for the port to pump its floodwaters. 
SR-14 is also being raised to the Columbia River's 500-year flood level, thus protecting it from future Columbia River floods. The Steigerwald Reconnection Project also includes the placement of nearly 2,000 logs to provide immediate habitat for many native species. The project will also reforest 225 acres of floodplain by planting over 300,000 native plants, such as willow, cottonwood, spirea, ferns, and dogwood. Of great interest to many of you, the project will greatly improve recreation opportunities at the refuge by reconstructing its trail system. Specifically, the project will install two new bridges, lengthen the trail system by one mile, and increase parking capacity by 50%. Along the way, project staff are carefully salvaging existing art pieces so they can be reinstalled during the construction of the new trail system. There is a lot going on this summer and next to prepare the refuge for being reconnected to the river for the first time in over 50 years and to improve the recreation experience for you and the thousands of other people that value this place. Keep up to date on this project this year and next by visiting the website Refuge 2020 and get ready to visit the new and improved refuge in early 2022. In the meantime, thanks for your patience. Thanks also to our partners for their hard work and financial contributions. Well, Dan and Sasha, thank you for that uh, introduction and uh, Ryan for sharing the video. Um, and thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Really excited to uh, share some of this project with you. And um, the, the presentation I wanna give tonight will give you some details on the project itself. And we're actually two years into a three-year project. So um, we'll not only talk about the project itself and the benefits, but also kind of give you an update on what's happened thus far and uh, tell you what's gonna happen this year as we look to wrap things up. So um, real quick, this is, um, you've seen this picture a couple of times now, but this is what the site looked like in 1939. So before any great level of disturbance happened. And then this is what it looks like now here at the bottom of the screen. And really in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is rewind the clock a little bit. Um, is this is an urban refuge, it's right at the interface of the gorge and the Portland Vancouver metro area. So there's been a lot of development around it but it really is um, a, a beautiful, amazing resource. And we're gonna try to take it back as much as we can in time so that it functions um, like it did historically, obviously within the constraints of some of the development that's happened. And the project really has four primary goals. The, the, and we'll talk about those a little bit throughout this presentation. But the first is to restore access for fish um, primarily salmon and lamprey is what we're focused on. We want to improve habitat. As you saw in the video, there's um, you know, a significant issue with invasive species. So we're looking to recreate some of those nice native uh, floodplain habitats that existed historically. We want to reduce the flood risk for um, not just the Port of Camas Washougal, who owns the levee system out there, but also the city of Washougal, their wastewater treatment facility, and some of the residents along Gibbons Creek. And then um, as we noted in the video, we wanna improve recreation opportunities for you folks and everybody else. Steigerwald is a very popular refuge. It sees about 90,000 visitors a year. So really a incredible opportunity to make that um, user experience a little bit better. So how are we gonna do all this? Um, so this is a map of what we plan to accomplish at the site. And it's pretty busy, there's a lot going on, but we can boil it down to six basic project elements. And the first is um, we're gonna build two setback levees. So there's one here in brown at the Western end of the site. And there's one at the Eastern end of the site. And so those setback levees will look just like the levee that you walk on when you're walking the trail along the Columbia River. Um, same geometry, same elevation. Uh, they're owned by the port, they're regulated by the Corps. So um, we're rebuilding them to current flood protection standards. By rebuilding those, essentially what we do is we take one big levee system and we turn it into two smaller ones. And that allows us to remove the entirety of the existing levee that's between those two setback levees. So that's about two and a quarter miles of existing levee that will come out actually this summer, and that'll reconnect the site to the Columbia River. 
And then the next thing we'll do is remove all the Gibbons Creek infrastructure. So when you park in the existing parking lot at Steigerwald, you're pretty close to the Gibbons Creek diversion structure. And you start walking out the elevated canal, which is essentially an aqueduct. And that leads all the way out to the river to a fish ladder, which connects Gibbons Creek to the river. So all that will be removed and that'll reconnect Gibbons Creek to the floodplain. So when it's all said and done, Gibbons Creek will flow um, on that floodplain service through its historic alluvial fan down through Steigerwald Lake, which is here, and then out to the Columbia River here. Now, the only infrastructure that is at increased flood risk, so everybody's flood risk, the port, the city, um, residents, um, the private ranch at the eastern end, everybody's flood risk either stays the same or goes down, except this little section of SR14. So to mitigate that increased flood risk, we this past summer raised that section of SR14 about two to three feet on average. It was a maximum of three feet. And that brings it up to the Columbia River's 500 year flood stage. So which is a very conservative level of flood protection. So that happened. And then we're also reconstructing the trail network, which is obviously exciting and of great interest to a lot of folks. Um, and the main difference in that is you'll now park here. You'll walk out this new setback levee to the south. And then when you hook up with the river and start walking to the east, the red tail loop will stay the same. But when you get just past red tail, the new trail will dip in and out of the refuge. There'll be a couple new bridges. They'll cross some nice new floodplain channels. So I think it'll just be a much more interesting and diverse uh, user experience. And the trail will be a mile longer. And then we'll reforest about 225 acres of native riparian habitat. And as, as Dan said in his presentation, um, you know, the friends, uh, there's a lot of people involved in this project and no one more important than the friends. Their acquisition of the 175 acres, um, which is about, it's over 15% of the site um, at that Eastern end there absolutely was critical to um, the implementation. We wouldn't be talking about this project if it hadn't been for, for Dan and his predecessor, Kate and all the good work that the Land Trust does. So really wanna um, acknowledge the friends and their, their contribution to this project. So this is what the site looks like from the air. So to walk you through, and this is kind of the sequence that we're actually constructing the project. So this is um, taken, obviously we're looking south across the site, Columbia River in the background with, you know, with Oregon behind it. So the first thing we did this summer was worked on raising SR14. Then we started building our setback levees. So this is the west setback levee, and obviously the eastern setback levee is, is off the screen. And the west one here is, is built to continue protecting the port of Camas Washougal, their industrial park, the city's wastewater treatment facility, and then these residents up here, um, kind of the north part of the levee, which is city of Washougal residents. So we'll build the setback levees. We'll remove that existing, that two and a quarter miles of the existing levee. We'll build our new parking lot, which we actually just completed this winter. And then it'll connect to the new trail system. And so that new parking lot will be relocated. It will no longer be here on the east side of Gibbons Creek. It'll actually be west, pretty close to the, um, the mobile home park. Then we'll remove that diversion structure, elevated canal and fish ladder, reconnect Gibbons Creek um, through Steigerwald Lake and all the way out to the river. And obviously it's not quite as easy as it looks on the screen. There's a lot of work that goes on behind this, but um, that's, that's the, the gist of, of our project out there. So what are the benefits? Um, obviously there's some recreation education benefits. This improves the trail system. It'll be more diverse, it'll be a mile longer. We talked about that. Public education, we've got a grant from the state um, that'll help bring about 2000 students and volunteers, which is a really exciting opportunity for us and the friends and the Gorge Refuge Stewards, our partners to bring the local community and really um, engage them very tangibly in this project. Uh, we'll restore about 965 acres of historic floodplain 
will create or restore about 120 acres of wetland habitat. We'll have unobstructed access for salmon and lamprey. As you saw in the video, there is no access to the floodplain now, and Gibbons Creek is only accessible by an outdated fish ladder. And then we'll reestablish about 225 acres of native riparian forest. On the economic side, it's, it's a big project. Um, it'll, it'll be well north of 20 million when it's done. So that's a lot of jobs. And it's brought some nice attention to the community. We, um, Kevin and I got to meet the governor. He came down and, and um, toured the site a couple of years ago. So it's uh, this is one example of um, some nice, um, you know, shining a spotlight, not only on the gorge, but just Washougal and that, that resource there. And then flood control, it does reduce flood risk for um, both pri private and public infrastructure and O&M costs for the port and the refuge. And I think personally, one of the, one of the great benefits of the project is it's really located um, on the border of the scenic area, which is obviously on the border of, of the Portland, Vancouver metro area and the gorge. And this is an area that, um, Naturally, floodplain habitat is constrained in the lower part of the gorge. And then it's obviously been heavily developed uh, to the west of the site in the Portland, Vancouver metro area. So we've, we've just lost an amazing amount of habitat to PDX and to other commercial and industrial de development. So this is a site that it's just an amazing opportunity to restore habitat, floodplain habitat, which is critical to so many species. Um, in a really heavily, or in a, in a portion of the lower Columbia that's both naturally and anthropogenically um, constrained with, with available habitat. So in a nutshell, this project will increase the amount of accessible floodplain habitat by about 19% in this part of the river. And what I mean by this part of the river is between the confluence with the Willamette all the way up to Bonneville Dam. So a big bump in available floodplain. Uh, as far as our timeline, this is a, um, a timeline that I pulled from the Refuge 2020 website, which um, we'll share a link with at the end of the presentation. It's a great resource to learn more about the project. Um, we started construction actually in 2019. Um, we had a pretty soft start, really got rolling last June, so June of 2020. And then we'll wrap it up. Um, the construction piece will wrap up in November of this year, uh, November, December. And then we've got a lot of planting to happen next winter. So the wet refuge, the whole project will be complete um, in March or April of next year. So almost exactly a year from now. And that's the same time that the refuge will fully reopen. So what have, what have we accomplished to date? Um, again, we've, we've had um, two years of construction um, and a you know, our first big push being last year. So we've enhanced about 53 acres of Gibbons Creek's alluvial fan, so nice riparian habitat. We elevated State Route 14. Again, that's about 1,300 linear feet. Um, so I apologize for anyone that was trying to get off the gorge last summer, you probably got delayed on your drive if you were, if you were heading out on 14. Uh, we realigned and enhanced Gibbons Creek. Um, the section of Gibbons Creek north of SR 14. We constructed the flood wall, which is the northernmost part of the west setback levee. Um, because of space limitations, we transitioned from an earthen levee to a concrete flood wall. So we built that last year. We constructed the foundation for both um, of the new setback levees. We built about half of our floodplain wetlands. So 65 acres is complete, and we've got about uh, almost that much to go. And then we built the new parking lot. So we, we don't have a ton of time. So really quickly, I want to make sure we save time for questions. I'm going to um, jump through and show you just a few slides about, um, give you an update on exactly what has been accomplished. So on the alluvial fan shown in the red circle here, planted a bunch of trees um, and shrubs, and we're excited. This is what they look like now, or what they looked like last September. Um, a lot of cottonwoods and willows, pretty healthy above ground and below ground, we actually dug one up, just seems like an odd thing to do when you just planted some trees, but they're really sending out um, a nice root mass, which, which bodes well for our, um, 
future plantings of the site. So far, very successful. SR14, um, again, most of you being folks that love and um, recreate in the gorge have probably seen this, but we raised that short little section of 14. It's a little flatter than it used to be. Uh, Gibbons Creek north of 14 looked like this last June, and now it looks like this. Um, we actually shifted the creek to the, uh, to the east to make room for that concrete flood wall we talked about. And in doing that, we put in a lot of wood, um, created some nice habitat features, gave the creek a floodplain, so that it went from what is a very U-shaped channel. So if you look at a channel like this in cross section, it's essentially a, a canal. So we took it from that to looking something like this, which is nice and broad and messy, has a floodplain, um, a lot of nice habitat features, which salmon, lamprey, and other species really, really like and need to, frankly, they need to thrive. This is what our flood wall looked like during construction. And this is what it looks like now that it's finished. Um, we did this, whole, almost the whole site is within the, the gorge scenic area. Um, I can't give you an exact number, but roughly 90% of the acreage, including this flood wall is primarily within the scenic area and worked very closely with the landscape architect at the Forest Service to come up with this rock pattern, um, the stain color, all these things to make sure the project um, adheres to the scenic area requirements. And then the setback levees themselves. This is what the site looked like last June. And this is what it looked like in September. We're building that west setback levee. So this is some of the ports industrial park here, the very Eastern end of their industrial park. And this is what the West setback levee looks like now. So again, we, our goal for last year was to get the foundation down so we can get an early start on construction this spring. And then where are we getting the soil? It's, um, it's actually 1.5 million cubic yards of soil for anybody that's been in construction or engineering. That's, that's a, lot of, a lot of earthwork. And we're sourcing all that on site. And we're trying to be really strategic about how we do it both getting quality material for the levees, but also trying to create as much um, beneficial habitat as we can while we're sourcing um, that levee fill. So we're creating areas like this where folks that know the site well, over here on the right is the levee, existing levee in the trail. And this is the fence where public access ends. And this is Straub Lake over here. So between Straub Lake and the trail is now, uh, I think this wetland ended up being about 38 acres, if I remember right off the top of my head. This is the largest one we've constructed so far. Um, so it'll impound in the winter about uh, between six and 18 inches of water. This is what it looks like on the ground now, um, or at least a couple months ago. So a lot of, a lot of wood features, it's been hydro seeded. Um, it's now been planted with willows and other species, so still a little bit like a mud puddle, but when you, by the time the refuge reopens, this will be a nice, um, nice wetland feature. Uh, we did plant some wapto out here among some other species of interest. And then the new parking lot. This is what that looks like from the air. Uh, exciting thing about the new parking lot, you'll, again, you'll enter on the, on the west side of Gibbons Creek now. Um, you'll pull into the parking lot. Um, it's instead of, it's 50% larger. There, the existing parking lot had 20 spaces. This one has 30. We were able to relocate all the um, architectural elements. So it'll still have the same kiosk and some of the same artwork. And then you walk down this little pass, path to hop up on the new levee and the trail out to the south. So this year um, we, we did a lot last year, but we've got a big year ahead of us still as we look to wrap things up um, next winter. So we'll remove um, that two and a quarter miles of existing levee. We'll finish building the setback levees. We'll finish all our habitat improvements like the wetland grading and the wood placement. Remove all that Gibbons Creek infrastructure, complete the trail system, and we'll plant about 150 acres of plants. So, um, Hope we see all of you volunteers next winter. There'll be planting events. Um, 
you know, with between us and the friends and Gorge Refuge Stewards um, hosting and co-hosting, I think there'll be a lot of opportunities to get involved in the project next winter as we as we plant some trees. And just real quick, um, acknowledgements, uh, Bonneville Power Administration um, has been with us the whole way funding this project since its inception. And during the construction phase, they were joined by the Department of Ecology, uh, NIFWIF, and Fish and Wildlife Service to provide all the construction funding. Key partners, the port has been a great partner. They, they own the levee system and have worked with us very closely throughout. Fish and Wildlife obviously owns a refuge. Friends, we talked about their involvement, absolutely a key partner, WashDOT, WashDOT as well. Now our contractor is Rachi, um, has done a fantastic job for us. And then our design team, Wolfwater Resources, Corn Ford, and Murray Smith. And um, one last plug, if you want to learn more, there's blog posts, there's some videos, um, there's all sorts of information about the project at refuge2020.info. Um, give that a shout. And if that doesn't answer all your questions, we can do it here tonight, or um, feel free to reach out to Dan or I via email. And that is all I had. Awesome. So thank you all. We, I appreciate, um, appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Thank you, Dan and Chris. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you both um, taking the time, obviously, to be here and taking time out of your busy schedules to pull all in on what's going on behind the scenes at Staggerwall. So now we'll take a few minutes for Q&A. Um, please go ahead and send your questions for Dan and Chris into that chat box that you guys see on the bottom of your screen. It's this little icon that says chat and uh, we'll run through as many as we can with the time that we have this evening. Um, go ahead again, just send your um, questions in the chat box, click enter and we'll see them. Um, and I also have a few questions in the Q&A box and I will direct those to Chris and Dan real quick while everybody gets them in the chat box. So first question is, um, how about water running uphill? Um, you know, having hiked Staggerwald many times in this COVID era, folks always ask the same thing. Looking at the Columbia and then Staggerwald, how does water run uphill? So for either Dan or Chris, whoever would like to take it. That's actually a trade secret. I can't divulge that. <laughs> no, um, that is an excellent question. I mean, the levee, so it, I don't wanna go into too much information, but the levee system out there was actually built for the unregulated Columbia River. So it is at uh, about 46 feet elevation, which is about 13 feet higher than the peak of the 1996 flood. We just don't see floods like we used to in the Columbia River because of all the dams upstream. So when you are hiking at Steigerwald um, on the levee, you are truly way above the river. Um, but historically, that floodplain was connected at about 30 feet, an elevation that's about 30 feet below the top of the levee. That's historically the low point in the floodplain, and that's how the river was able to connect to it. So when it's all said and done, um, we're going to reestablish those historic elevations and you will see um, a lot more water both from the Columbia River flooding into the site but you'll also see a lot more from Gibbons Creek now that it's um, reconnected to the site coming in from you know the watershed up above to the north. Perfect thank you thank you Chris. Um, Elizabeth would like to know, any estimate when we might see salmon returning to Staggerwald? Um, yeah, no, that's that's really exciting. Um, we should, um, you know, I'm knocking on wood as I say this, we should wrap up construction um, in, you know, November, um, early November, and we'll wrap up the in-water portion of construction in October. And I suspect that as soon as you know, we're done with in water work. So working in the channels, reconnecting the site out to the river, which again has to be completed by early October, that pretty quickly we'll start to see coho salmon returning to the site um, in the fall. So, you know, October, November, we'll see some steelhead coming back in the winter. Um, so it, I don't think it'll take long and hopefully next winter um, we'll be able to show you some video proving that. 
Awesome. Look forward to that. Mike would like to know, is there any public access now? Um, very limited. Um, you can hike on the levee trail. Um, oh, sorry, I just lost power. Um, you can hike on the levee trail. That's interesting. It's never happened during a presentation before, but here we go. Um, I still have you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, fortunately, my laptop battery is charged. Um, so you can hike on the levee trail all the way out to the fish ladder now, and that will you'll be allowed to do that until sometime in April. And then um, starting in April, we will completely shut down access um, to the refuge and it'll be fully closed um, for about a year. And so the site will, the refuge will fully reopen um, in March or April of 2022. So very limited now and then fully reopening in about a year. Okay, thank you. Um, and then Peter would like to know, will East End public access run to S14? Um, will, sorry, I'm sorry, say that again. Will what access run to 14? It's okay, we now have your lights, so it's great, we can see you. Yeah, yeah. Um, will East End public access run to SR14? Not sure I totally understand that question. Um, the, I think he's asking if there will be a connection of the trail once it goes out to the end of the levee. Will it connect to 14 again? Oh, all the way down the east end? Yeah, yeah. Where it end, where it end. No, that's an excellent question. Um, so public access will be a little bit beyond what it is now, um, but not too much farther. It'll go, don't quote me on this, but a, about a quarter or a half mile further to the east, but it will stop um, short of the private property on the east end of the site. So it will not connect all the way through. Yeah. All right. And then Vince would like to know, is the risk of flood water intrusion into the wastewater treatment plant or, or accidental, accidental release of effluent into the Columbia improved as a result of this project? So is the risk of flood water intrusion into the water treatment plant improved as a result of this project? So the, the flood risk to the wastewater treatment plant goes down um, quite a bit. So the, there's, there's better flood protection for the wastewater treatment plant because of this project. And there's a lot of detail behind that, but the, the short, simple answer is there's much less, much less chance of any sort of effluent release. Awesome. <laughs> And then uh, Sharon would like to know, what is the status? Um, I'm not sure if either of you will know this, but what is the status of the private ranch adjacent refuge? I'm guessing status meaning, is it going to stay there or? Yeah, I'm not. Um, yeah the ranch at the east end of the refuge. Dan, do you want to answer that one or? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm happy to jump in. I think we'd say the same thing. It's private, it's private land and uh, is going to stay that way as far as we know for the time being. That family has owned that ranch for a long time and they have no plans to sell. Yeah, but they have been outstanding to work with and Chris has obviously had to work with them pretty extensively um, on this project. They've been very supportive. Awesome. And then we're going to do the last question. Um, what will be at the east end of the trail? Will there be parking or, or just a turnaround? Um, at the east end, it'll just be a turnaround. Um, the, the refuge plans to manage the trail system just like they do now. So uh, meaning that you'll, you'll park at the new refuge um, and then once you are on the levee system, hiking south and then out along the river itself, you'll be allowed to hike, bike, jog, um, take your dog. Um, and I think equestrian also is allowed but any of the trails like interior to the refuge, like the Red Tail Lake Trail um, are hikers only. So that general management plan, um, they plan to maintain that after the project is complete. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions. That's, uh, that's every single one that was sent in. So I'm happy we had time for those. Thank you, Dan and Chris. Again, thank you so much. Thank you and thanks to yeah. out there. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, appreciate it.